I'd say I became an actor because I was probably a little bit on the shy side and a really, really oh, sensitive, like empath kind of kid. I put a hundred percent of my like time and energy into preparing for a role, and I found a good balance. Like the shows and the jobs that I've been able to do will get me like three days a week on the set, and I get to go and have fun and be creative and crack jokes, have my life, and then come home and be present. I'm a much, much better mom since I like have found a, a balance with my work. Being a mom is the toughest job there is, and it doesn't come with instructions. So it's okay if you don't have all the answers. We'll figure it out together. This is Mom Brain with Ilaria Baldwin and Daphne Oz. I'm Lindsay Price. I am a mother and a wife and an actor and an and a activist. And um, you can find me at, what is my handle on I think Instagram? It's Lindsay Price. Lindsay J. Price. At Lindsay J. Price on Instagram. Yeah. You have two boys. I have two little boys. Yeah. And are you done having kids? I feel like Curtis and I are good parents to two, but we would become average to not great parents to three. Mm -hmm. I just feel like our lives are so busy, and and I I don't really mean that. I think we probably rise to the occasion and and be, you know, great at it, and that would be our new normal. But for the time being, it's just we'd like went from zero to sixty. We met, right. bought a house, got pregnant. Got married, you know, like everything yeah. happened in in um, like six years. So I think just we need to catch our breath. But then by the time we catch our breath, it's probably too late to have another one. No, I don't know. I don't, know. I don't know. No, 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 no. But I mean, hey, I I get it. What I, Alec and I met each other, but basically the next year we got married. Yeah. And then I got pregnant by the end of that year, and then I was, you know, until last week I've been pregnant and or breastfeeding for oh my gosh. six years. Six years. It's, it's, that's Six full months. on lady. <laughs> that's years, a long time. Preg- I got pregnant yes. September, or, or no, uh, December, 2012. I got pregnant with Carmen and then I yeah. got pregnant breastfeeding each child. So oh. yeah. So now I'm having like a tiny little break. So it's yeah. your first break. It's in my a long first, time. it's my first like break. How does it feel? The break? I have to say that, I mean, I've had a week, week into it. Right. I've, I am sleeping better because, you know, you don't sleep when you're pregnant. Oh, and you don't sleep when you're, And I co-sleep with my kids and so my baby just transitioned into his crib. Yeah. There's an element of it. I wake up and I feel so much better. I mean, I'm, I love having them in bed with mm-hmm. me. I love it so much. But no, I'm, I'm going to, I know that we'll probably have another one. Right. So I'm trying to enjoy yeah. the experience of like, you know, having a little bit of rest. And, and, you know, I look at him cause there's always that sadness for me when, when I stop breastfeeding, um, uh, cause I enjoy it so much. Mm. And, um, and, but he's like so much a part of the team now. Like he's just like, he sits and has breakfast and dinner. They oh. all have breakfast and dinner together. And, um, lunchtime is like everywhere else, but everybody has a different schedule, but it's really cute to like see him. Like these are his, like, this is his tribe. These are yeah. his siblings. Yeah. So not just having to be an isolated baby, yeah. which he is when he's with you by, when, he's when he gets him, so yeah. much alone time and with you by yourself. And, you but know. I think whether you have one child or, I mean, when you have one more that, sorry, when you have more than one child, you have to let them be only children and you have to mm. let them be, you know, in the group as well. So, like, I try to do individual activities. How, how is your relationship with your kids? How are their relationships it's, together? You know, when I had Hudson, our oldest, who's um, seven now, it was the first time in my entire life, because I've been working since I was a teenager, it was the first time that I didn't work. I decided to, you know, I mean, obvious, obviously... I didn't think I was ever going to give up my career completely, but I couldn't see how I could do it with as much of my body and soul and like in, like intention and energy was going into him. I didn't know how I could do 18 hours a day on a set, you know, tops yeah. to tails. And I just, I couldn't figure it out. And nothing was more important, to be honest. So we, we had a lot of time together. And Curtis traveled a lot and he opened two restaurants. And, you know, we were, it was kind of the two of us, you know, super supportive and amazing when Curtis was home. But we had to kind of figure it out on our own. We traveled. He'd been to like 11 different countries in his first year of life. Oh and, you know, gosh. I just tucked him under and like we would sit at, you know, fancy restaurants and I'd just breastfeed him under the table and then put him down <laughs> under the table and like we would hide him. Um, so we have a really, really great bond. When Emerson, who's four now, came along, somebody gave me the advice because I was having a lot of anxiety about, you know, how Hud was going to feel to the second we walk in the door or the first time that the old that Hudson would say, you know, pick me up or I, you know, put the baby away to put the baby down and immediately, Mm -hmm. you know, show him attention. And then he'd see that it was still okay, right? So I did that. But then I took that theory a little too far, I think. I would like 
go with Hudson to preschool and he'd say, I'm not ready for you to leave. And we went to a really developmental, like play-based pre- preschool yeah. that was cool with whatever um, so you could attachment. Stay so I could stay all day. So I would just thinking, well, he needs me. And I might not have had the same like time that I had, you know, with Hudson that I did with Emerson. I know, but you know what? They, they adapt and yeah. they become who they are in the lineup of, of how they are. You know, yeah. I, there is... I think the the hardest transition we talk about this a lot on Mom Brain. The hardest transition is between one and two. I think it might be. <laughs> so the first, I mean, because the thing is, you have that feeling that mostly you're cheating on your child mm-hmm. with another child, and so you know you have your your pride and joy, and all of your energy goes to that one. And Car- we had the same thing with Carmen. We traveled so much. We yeah. went everywhere. She came out to dinner with us. I like. Every single night. And she would just fall asleep in her like little chair or on me or in the front pack or whatever. And, um, and then I felt really guilty once I had a second one, but you know, then it, you know, Rafa, at least for me right away, it all seemed to, to be, you know, our team. Yeah. But there, it was difficult for me in terms of I'm focusing all my energy over here and now I have to focus on in two places. And how do you find that balance? Mm -hmm. I found by the third um, the third time I was already used to the multitasking. Right. And so it wasn't as stressful. And then the fourth one is like nothing happened. People say that like, like one to two is hard. Two to three is like whatever. But I'm yeah. like, but you can't get in a cab anymore. Like now you have to have two, like as a family unit, you know, it's just a different, it's a, I feel like it would be a big, big number. Although we have two boys and I always thought I I'd be a girl, girl. mom. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You, yeah. you only really reckon with that after it's not the reality. Where, like that you had some implant in your mind of like, I'll be a girl mom or right. I'll be a boy mom or whatever it might be. I think that there's so many things that can make you feel really guilty or mm. stretched thin or like you're not doing enough as a mom. Um, and especially as a mom of, of actually, you know what, even with, with quote unquote, just one child, like things take you away from them. And yeah. there are always going to feel like those moments where you wish you had more to give them or you wish that there was more of you to give them. Right, yeah. um, but I think certainly as you have more ki- children to share those 24 hours of the day with, they they do have to adapt. Like someone had told me, the oldest one, certainly when I brought John home after Philo, she was 20 months old. She's aware of missing you. She's aware of wanting to be with you. Where he's mm-hmm. kind of like, just give me a boob every once right. in a while and change my diaper yeah. and like, I'll be okay. He doesn't really, like not fully aware of who is with him the rest of the time. Right. So I really took that to heart and tried to make sure that she didn't feel like she was losing her her most important female relationship mm-hmm. with her mother and um, and the time that she craved with me. And and do I think that the children I've had after her had uh, understandably they've had less private time with me they've had less alone time although John and I do individually make a real effort to have alone time with each of our kids which is a luxury I mean it's yeah, a luxury that we are able to juggle that when we can and you know certainly on weekends like it makes it a little bit easier um, but I think it's a little bit goes a long way in that regard but I also think that for good or bad, like the life experience your kids have as the second and third and fourth and fifth and 12th sibling Mm -hmm. uh, evolves them. It makes them maybe more, more flexible, more resilient, less, less like, like less dependent on that external feedback Mm -hmm. for their own validation, you know, or they figure out other ways to compensate for it. And I think that I'm just, I'm always trying to look out for us as moms to not yeah. feel like we're not doing enough because spe- if you're listening to this podcast if you're sitting here in this room like <laughs> you want to be the best and yeah. you're doing everything you can to be that way and um and I think some and kids are different like my oldest needs more from me emotionally than I think That's the others right. do you know every first child has a, in my like information gathering since I've been a mom every first child has a similar sort of trepidation caution don't you mm-hmm. think that they're a little more like um sometimes a little more sensitive mm-hmm. and a hundred percent it's what we put my into my daughter them, is right? like the mother hen like right now she's going through this fearful period where she thinks that the boys they're going to get hurt all the time so and like oh. the, like we're in the a hotel obviously because we're visiting and they'll just like run down the hallway now nothing is going to happen to them she starts freaking out and screaming so and going like, no, no, Rafa or Leo or whatever. And like grabs them by the shirt. You can't do that. You have to be scared. And I said, Carmen, it's okay. <laughs> 
they're not going to get hurt. It's so mm-hmm. nice so that you're worried yeah. about them. Mm-hmm. But it, I think it's just a phase that she's going through. But it is that I was much more cautious with her yeah. than with the than with my other yeah. ones. You know, I mean, of course, like you're cautious with each one in some mm-hmm. in some ways. You don't want them to get hurt, but you calm down a little bit. Yeah. And I think also with the first one, it's so much of it is just your relationship with them. So when we get worried about we're not doing as much with our second one, how much of our relationship is just because it's coming from our perspective versus what is the child experiencing? You know what I mean? Your thoughts that you're laying them next to them and they're sleeping in bed and your thoughts are going on, they're just passed out. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the same thing, the same thing's happening with the second one. It's just you might not be laying there and thinking and having that whole experience and they're not aware, you know? Boys though, like brothers, officially we just got back to, yes, today, yesterday from a, a trip together and officially on this trip, I saw that the two boys were friends. And they're, you know, like Emerson's four. It took a long, long time. Emerson would just like lay down his life for his older brother. But Hudson is just like, he wakes up in the morning and his first thought is, how can I get away from him? Like, Uh, you know, how can I get like the piece of the pie to be bigger? It's just innately competitive. Yeah. Yeah. And the way they roughhouse him, I'm like... Okay, like can we talk about that? <laughs> can we, please, can we talk about the whole roughhousing yes. thing? Because it really stresses me out. Like, I don't know, I, I don't know if your kids have roughhouse, but like my boys are like crazy. So my closest two are 14 months apart. Okay. Rafa and Leo are 14 months oh apart. Gosh. I know. Wow. I found out I was pregnant when Rafa was six months old. I oh sat on the floor goodness. and I just cried. And of course, I, I love him and I'm so happy he's here. But like, that was not the plan. Right. Um, so anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, I just see them and they're aggressive mm-hmm. with each other. And then two seconds later, they're hugging and they're kissing each other. Like, I'm sorry. It's just the way it is with boys. I have to say, like, plus my, my husband is also Aussie and, and there's a certain, like, they call it rough and ready or like, you know, there's a certain mentality that is just like <laughs> rough and ready. And, I, and I'm, you know, I, I did, when I got pregnant, I was so... It was the first time in my life that I didn't like feel like I could handle it. I knew I'd be a good mom, but I didn't, I just didn't know about breastfeeding. I was afraid of like poop diapers. I was afraid of everything. So I read everything. And my, what I realized was that it was going to be like, I would make sure that I gave them a voice and I'd make sure to never like baby them. And I had all of these things and raising boys is really complicated, right? Especially in today's day and age, mm-hmm. we need to raise them to not have to just suck it up or like man up or whatever it is. But Curtis with his Aussie way, like they would fight or fall. And he'd look at them, and when they would cry or react, he'd just, like, he'd do what guys usually do and just not react. And then say, uh, no blood, mate. Just get up. No blood. And that was, I'm like, no blood? <laughs> like, that's the I like criteria that. of whether I like or not. that policy, you know, actually. Like it kind of, like, now I watch them roughhouse, and, you know, they they go for it. They but where, will how do you teach them? Like, is that something that, that you go for, or do you teach them limits? Or I do. I do. You do. I don't like it. You know, for me, I don't, I don't feel like when they're playing, it's fine and it's fun. You know, I'm sure they do a lot of like tickling and like they do like these competition sort of like tag games. But if it ever becomes anything where they put their hands on each other because like out of anger. Yeah. Never, 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 never. It's Mm -hmm. funny because there are going to be, there are going to be those moments where kids go too far and, Mm -hmm. and they're kids, they're testing boundaries. That's literally what they're doing. That's part of their psychological development. But I, but I think... Something, it for whatever reason, I, the, the the mothering that I think has been most effective and the men that I think have come out the most balanced are the ones that were allowed to be physical mm-hmm. when they needed to be. Like, and maybe it, it could literally just be like feedback to their nerves. They, they just need some, like pushback. They need yeah. to bounce into things. They just there's there's a physicality to mm-hmm. them that is masculine. Um, and they were allowed to have that feedback and they were allowed to rough house within reason, not mean spiritedly, but there's that playful kind of like baby bear cub. We just want to like puppies. roll around yeah. and just get messy together. But they were also simultaneously given license to have an emotional side. They And, yeah. and I love that. And we we're going to give them a voice. Like you're going to teach them how to express their emotions so that being physical wasn't their only way. You're going to teach them how to say like, I really didn't like that. That made me uncomfortable. Like it made me, um, it, made, it hurt me, like whatever. Like to, to not have to suppress those feelings mm-hmm. as though they weren't one in the same. Like that you you can be physical. You and, can be both. And be, and still say that hurt and I didn't like it. So let's not do it that way again, you know? And I think it's funny because I have one son and two daughters and I have another daughter coming. And um, my son, I will notice with his older sister, who's 20 months older than he is, 
this morning even they were he was having like he was having a meltdown because he's really into basketball and we're we're renting a house out here in, in um, LA and we're in this really cute little neighborhood and, like almost every um uh driveway has a basketball net in it which is something I'm so not used to as you know right. having been in Manhattan for 10 years and then Florida the last year and no you know people didn't have like basketball nets in their backyards and so right. he's freaking Obsessed. out he thinks is like the coolest thing he's ever seen the idea that there would be like neighborhood kids that he could play with and play basketball so cute <laughs> so at literally 5 30 in the morning this morning when he woke up on east coast time he just right, it's it, 8 30 in the morning yeah, for him <laughs> he demanded that i take him to go play on the quote neighbor's basketball court um so <laughs> so, so so i like forced him to wait till the relatively reasonable time of like 6 30 and we go and we find this place on a little cul-de-sac and there happens to be a basketball outside waiting for us and we play and we play and play and and 15 minutes later when he can't make the basket on the adult net which frustrates him because mm -hmm. he's three but he thinks he's michael jordan so he should be able to make these <laughs> nets we go back inside and he's having just a tough time accommodating this frustration within himself right so part of what i've learned with him is sometimes it's just the physicality that he needs so i let him jump mm -hmm. on the bed to get that out. and then philomena my daughter really wants to get in on that so she does too and then she'll like hit him with a pillow or you know she'll do something to try to just escalated a little bit mm -hmm. and I recognize it as an older yeah. sibling myself there's a little needling mm -hmm. that happens that you think you're going to get away with and like maybe you'll hurt them a little bit but like right. not too bad you know right. Right. Um, <laughs> and he'll just like try to wail on yeah. her and I it's a really I really want to be aware of because I yell at her more quickly because mm -hmm. she's more rational quote unquote right she's the one at five that she should she, be she able, should know better she should know better and I'll be like filming you can't you know do this or whatever but what I'm really protecting against is him. I'm protecting against his inability to control his impulse mm -hmm. or his more likely that he'll get hurt, not her. And like, you know, all these things. So there are these dynamics that happen for all siblings. But I but I worry, I think, w it, would it be different if he had an older brother um, and how that would have moderated itself out of him or no, into it would, him? No, it would have been I don't worse. Know. Maybe it would have been worse. Let me tell you something. It would have been worse. I mean, and, and I'm talking about there's like, bite marks on each other like yeah. they draw they literally will draw blood some not in a while no. but they've drawn blood before one time i maybe i may have told this story before but one time rafa a leo bit rafa on the lip and rafa comes comes and he comes up to me and he's like literally oh, so bleeding oh and he's gosh. like it's okay mommy it was just an accident like he's saying that and i'm like Aww. this is not an accident this is on purpose because they learned yeah. like at when they're because they're really yeah. little yeah, yeah. if you say it's just an accident then it's like no less than trouble. if you did it in pur right. on purpose um so yeah no it's they yeah i think I, I find i find the thing for me that really works with them and with just people in general in life is to like make sure that they know what they feel hurt right mm -hmm. like the physical stuff I get that they need to run around and have a great time and if they I really see it in them I'm like I, I totally see that you guys need to like get your sillies out go we got a giant sofa that's like it has low like, to the ground it's low to the Wide. ground huge it has like <laughs> ottomans you I know and they sectionals were invented for moms because they're like yes. the single grade they're like inborn playhouses <laughs> yes it's so smart yes that's their like they get on it and they do that thing or they get in the pool or they like they'll do a race or you know I let them do that but I also find that it's always if there's ever something that happens like you know lip biting or whatever it is Hudson one time in the closet stuck his foot out and literally purposely tripped Emerson and he ended up in the hospital like with you know oh it's like a plastic surgery outcome um I say to them what really happened like I need to know why especially for the person who did it did it and um and then we get to the bottom of it you know and I'm pro I've probably talked to my kids like they were grown-ups maybe a little too much like Hudson no, will come I into think it's good I because I so. think that the more that you talk to them like adults it makes them the kids are so smart They're so and it smart. makes them they might not get it right away mm -hmm. but they eventually will get it and yeah. I used to get up like very upset that it's like okay you hit this person don't ever do it again. Right. That the worst thing you can say as a parent is don't ever do it again because of course they're going to of do course. it again. So they're setting up, you know, this just like bad expectation from everybody of failure. Yeah. You know, and then, and then I've I used to get very upset like oh it's not working what I'm trying what I'm doing so I'm gonna try this I'm gonna try that and bouncing around to different methods which can some by kind times be good because mm. you know you find your way or you're just not you know staying consistent which is so important in parenting. Um, and what I realized is that people, they get it over a period of time. So talk to them the way that they should be spoken to, mm -hmm. you know, and I say that to Alec all the time. Like if, you know, he'll, he'll get frustrated with them a little bit more than I'll get frustrated with them. And he'll, and, and I'll say to them, I like your parenting in a way, would you like them to talk to you that way? Mm -hmm. Because whatever you're exemplifying to them, 
they're going to eventually do one day because you are power and they, the kids eventually and love, want to be power. Exactly. Which is power. Mm-hmm. I read somewhere um, the way you speak to your children now will become their inner voice and that just like – floored me 100 and and it stuck it sticks with me every day mm-hmm. because I do I'm officially now getting frustrated with them in a way that I never was before mm-hmm. I think some like our lives our lives are busier and I'm working now and two of them and two different schools and two different drop-offs and You're two tired. you know like chaos. I'm it's full on chaos yeah. and I'm not I'm not good with chaos I'm very very I'm I'm like great with my own life, straight A's, type A, like it's fine. <laughs> but taking care of other people's feelings is really hard for me because I care so much about them. Do you know what I mean? It's really, I mean, you know, yeah. it's such high stakes. Mm-hmm. And when it becomes chaos, I get a little bit overwhelmed. When when I, um, this is a very like semi non order, but I think comes back. Um, <laughs> say, mom brain. So when I got my period when I was 13 years old and I started getting like super hormonal mm-hmm. and kind of like, you would like lash out, the typical, typical stuff, you know, right. typical like teenage behavior. And my mother said to me, you know, I would say, well, it's my, it's that time of the month or, you know, I'm in pain or I feel like I'm tired, whatever. She said, you know what, being a woman, you just have to be that much stronger than mm-hmm. everybody else because you are, you do have these feelings every single month and you are up and down and you do have this kind of pain, but it never gives you the right to treat anybody badly. Mm-hmm. So you have to be with how you're feeling. You have to be with your emotions, which doesn't mean that you, you know, have to be a saint, but you have to take a deep breath and then treat people as they should be treated. It's not fair that somebody comes in and you just like lash out at them. Right, yeah. And when my kids are driving me crazy, I always try to remember that. And I always try to say, okay, they're being two and three and one and five. Mm-hmm. And I am a 35-year-old woman. And yes, I'm tired. And yes, I'm frustrated about this. And I'm scared about that. And I've got all of my own issues. But I need to make sure that my issues are not going to affect mm-hmm. them. Because I don't want to make my issues their issues. Yeah. And it's hard. But I always try to like remember that advice that my mother said, told me. Um, and it, I think it's 100%. I like that. It works yeah. like 78% of the time. <laughs> you can't hear all saying you can't be perfect. Like, I think it's really good. I'll, I The other thing I love to do with the kids is um, admit that I'm wrong, to yeah. be honest. We, you know what I mean? We talk about that a lot. I'm so sorry, buddy. That I overreacted right there, and, and, and this is why I did. And, you know, X, Y, and Z, I care about you, and I'm, I had a bad day. And their, their ability to express empathy for me is unbelievable you know and like also I, to see that you make mistakes like mm-hmm. you're god in their mind right you're the you're the center of the universe and that if if you're allowed to make mistakes and accept them and accept yeah. yourself with them and acknowledge them it frees them a little bit mm-hmm. too i think i think that's something that's really interesting like on the one hand we should strive to be our most perfect parenting selves and that's what this podcast is all about giving you good strategies and th- ways to think through dilemmas that we all go through mm-hmm. but um but also to be a little bit gentle with ourselves and to realize that our kids appreciate that too yeah. and that they they get it like even if they don't know how to put words to it they're so emotionally aware of everything the dynamics going Going on how you talk to yourself how you look at yourself mm-hmm. how you um how you you interact with people around you and i think uh you know adding less stress to your life wherever possible is always a good thing yeah. i want to talk to you about going back to work because i yes. think that that's first of all you're in an industry as an actress that is um hugely not on your schedule right? very so. hugely not on my schedule <laughs> and and um you know it certainly is a is a visual job mm-hmm. and um and one that invites a lot of i would think um self-criticism just because of the way that the industry works mm-hmm. and then you have to also go home and do your real job which is to be mother to these two little mm-hmm. boys and wife to curtis and all this stuff so i i'm really curious what the transition back to work has been like after having kids and um and what that feels like to you in terms of how it's maybe made you a better mother or maybe or made you a different version of yourself like what what talk to us about that experience First of all, I'd say I became an actor because I was um, probably a little bit on the shy side and a really, really okay. sensitive, like empath kind of kid. You know, I would feel how everybody felt and um, take it on. And so I think when I was young, I, I wanted to become an actor because that playing make believe came naturally to me mm-hmm. for some reason, but also that, like, I get to pretend to be someone else right now. I get to. Um, 
work out my teenage emotions and have the filter of pretending to be someone else. Right. You know, it was really healthy and never something that was for me like a physical thing. But at a certain age as a woman, I like I never thought I was a beautiful girl. I thought I was I'd rather be smart or funny or you know, um interesting, um strong. And um when I hit like my 20s and it became very clear that it was a physical thing as well, um I kind of like fought back a little bit. Do you know what I mean? I'd never felt like I had to be the skinniest girl. I would rather not. I put myself out of that category. Then I started to get jobs where, you know, like I was, they asked me to be in my underwear or like it was a love scene and I was playing these like lead. And then I realized that the thinner I looked and the more like physically perfect I looked, the more more opportunity I would have. (laughs) So now I, I gained 70 pounds with my first and I think 40 with my second. I've been, I've breastfed for 18 months. Like my body has not been my own. Yeah. And um, the cool thing about it is that I went back to my roots of why I wanted to be an actor in the first place, which is fully just being um, someone who experiences life and the world. And I had the most like transformative thing to ever happen to me in becoming a mom. The balance that it takes to, to, to love my career as much as I love or, you know, I'll never love them as much as I love my family, but to, to get that mm-hmm. balance right is really difficult. Because for me, um, to be an actor, like I, I put 100% of my like time and energy into preparing for a role and, you know, um, staying staying in that mind frame and even sleep or like what else? Sleep, mm-hmm. oh my God, to remember your lines. You know, it's, it's a really tricky one. Mm-hmm. And I've had to find a way to um, support myself. I have a mom that, that's awesome that helps. Um, Curtis is an incredibly hands-on husband, um, and then I, and I had to hire a nanny, and I I found ways to like support myself at home, but it's difficult. I don't ever feel I never feel like I'm a hundred percent in one place anymore. Forever, I'm like divided, and that focus for my work is really kind of difficult. Um, I don't think that it'll be like this forever. I know they're like you know when kids are young, they're it's just like mommies are, the, they're the mommies. So I know there'll come a time where they, they're fine with me working 12 hours on a set <laughs> or 15 hours on a set. Um, I found a good balance. Like the shows and the jobs that I, I've been able to do um, will get me like three days a week on the set. And I get to go and have fun and be creative and crack jokes or do whatever, have my life and then come home and be present. I'm a much, much better mom since I like have found a, a balance with my work. I love that yeah. you see it as supporting yourself too, which I think is such a like a, a critical sort of mind shift mm. that people need to feel is, look, look, obviously you work to earn money. You work to support your family. Mm-hmm. Like that is the primary concern. But also there's a real emotional and mental rigor from being around adults. Like yes. that has to happen so that you can feel complete and so that you can feel if that's something that you were drawn to and if yeah. it's something if it's something you don't miss like more power to you that's amazing but I think if you were drawn to that and you feel like that's missing from your life it is so worth it to invest in yourself in that way and you are a better mother as a result of having had the opportunity to to do it you know it sounds like in a really wonderfully balanced way um yeah. but but you know to find that system that also just makes it so you're not like nervous all the time you're not you know calling home worrying that everything's falling through the cracks you have this infrastructure in place and I and I Mm -hmm. I you know I think we I think we feel I I certainly felt like um if you don't do it all if I I, somewhere along the way I'd absorb something like if I wasn't doing it all myself it meant that I'd it meant it meant that you know I wasn't being the full mother I could be and then at some point after you know when I went back to work after Mm -hmm. having Philomena and I went back pretty early on when she was like two months old and we hired the most incredible nanny who was like literally my wife (laughs) (laughs) um it it made me realize how much that was an absolute falsehood that no one had ever explicitly said to me. I just was absorbed somewhere along the way that I was a better mother from having ha- from having that friendship that I had in raising my children yeah. um, and and that support network that I could count on so that I could do my job really well and so that I could come home and be the mother I wanted to be really well. We uh, overcomplicate things too because if you if you dial it back to nature, which for some reason in our household we always do. <laughs> like when things seem too big, we're like, well, what was it like naturally in the beginning? Yeah. You know, um, women would support each other like tribally. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Your sister and your mom and your grandmother and your neighbor, they were all around. So if you needed like five minutes to, you know, 
take a shower, chill out. <laughs> that was a hundred percent possible, you yeah. know. And um, now we just do it a little bit differently. We we find women to like we fill up our tribe and we find a way to support each other that way, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I want I I I want to make sure before before we have to end. Yeah. Um, Cal is no longer not giving us the warning yet, but I always I just have him like a feeling that's going to happen he's, soon. He's brewing over there. Uh, <laughs> he is. I, I do want to talk a little bit about adoption because that yeah. is a that is a cause that's very near and dear to your heart. Now your your mom was adopted, correct? Right. Yeah. So my mom was from. Um, she was orphaned during the Korean War. Um, her mother probably was young and her father was killed in the war and it's even today is such a patriarchal society that if you're a single woman um you're sort of a social outcast so she quickly remarried because it was tough times and she left my mom and a newborn baby brother with like a neighbor or an uncle or someone um like that and um they were abusive to my mom who was five at the time So she put her little brother on her back and they ran away in the middle of the night and she walked, um, as I'm sort of piecing it together, I'm not even like, could it possibly be from the north to the south? Like she talked about crossing a river. She has these vague memories of how to um, survive or how she got to an orphanage in Seoul in Korea. But she um, will be in like a park somewhere and she'll say, Lindsay, you can eat the bottom of that fern if you're ever really hungry. Like the the idea of what she had to Learn. endure to survive. Yeah. And she was always a mother. She was always making sure that this baby was okay, her brother. So also for me, like attaching that to the conversation we just had about work and stuff, I'm like, my mom gave, she gave us everything because it was in her like DNA. It was like coded in her from that zero to seven that you're like forming all of your feelings about love and life survival and it's for another person so for me to go to work first of all it's just like you know she wants to support me and she wants me to have my dreams but I always feel that but the family is the most important thing Mm -hmm. how could you possibly you know what I mean see I thought I was thinking about we were talking about you know our five-year-olds and you know trying to stop them from killing each other right but to think of what a five-year-old can is do capable of in an instance where they're needed to do something like that. I mean, yeah. it's just mind-blowing And that me. being said, you know, like also survival instincts are a whole other thing. Like yeah. something kicks in and, she, you know, she had that. But she did get to Korea and she, and she knew traveling sort of in these packs of kids who were all in similar situations that if they got to um, an orphanage and were adopted um, – and got an education that they would have a chance that they would be oh okay. Gosh. And she, she found a way to get into um, this orphanage that also, you know, it's not the happy ending. They're very corrupt these places. But um, my grandfather was one of the founders of World Vision, um, one of the founding members. You know, they like would say twenty bucks a month could sponsor a kid in, in a country. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can you can like help third world situations and out of war and that kind of thing. And she, and he came to the orphanage and they put together a choir of Korean orphans to like tour the um, world and thank all the countries for their aid in the war and promote world vision. And she was chosen to be a part of that choir. And she asked him at the end of the the tour, can I, will you please adopt me? So he did. And he was a missionary. So when my mom left on this tour with the choir, he ran away because he was devastated that he was alone. And my grandfather went back um, whenever he could save money. He went back to Korea once every two months or, you know, six months and found him and adopted him as well. No. Yeah. You're kidding That's me. That's the most so amazing story. for me, adoption is incredibly important because, you know, especially today, modern day, like the foster care system, you've got, you know, 85% of the people that are incarcerated were in foster care. Um, prostitution and like all of the statistics are that our problems – are sort of based out of people who've never felt like they belonged or had love. And it's really, really hard to adopt. The The red tape is incredibly hard, and it's super expensive. So Adopt Together, um, that I have I met this couple in preschool, actually. Um, not my preschool, Hudson's preschool. Um, <laughs> they crowd fundraise for adoptions. And I was like, I'm going to do whatever I can to help you. So it's like a Kickstarter. So if you're a couple and you've got five grand, but you don't have the 45 extra, um, they'll start the audition, uh, audition, <laughs> adoption process of finding your child, but then they'll start raising the money so that when you finally get that connection, the money's there to adopt. Wow. So if you want to do it, if you're, if you've been thinking about adoption, there's absolutely a way. And this is like an incredible, um, supportive community as well, you know, to raise money for. Why is it so expensive? There's legal fees and, um, and they have to obviously like 
look up, down, and sideways to make sure that those connections are um, um, sound and okay. Um, it's a long, long process. Yeah. And that's why. Which is crazy. Like we, like, we could get pregnant and not, like, we could be working at Starbucks and nobody would say you can't support a child. Right. You know what I mean? But y- you don't need like, an initial 60,000. Yeah, 100%. There needs to be a better system. You know, Alec and I, we had you know, conversations about adopting at certain points. Mm. Um, but I've heard that, and I don't know if this is true, but I, I spoke to a couple of my friends who've adopted and they said it's very important if you have a number of biological children that you should adopt more than one mm-hmm. together because they yes. can feel like they're a little bit of outcast, um, mm-hmm. even no matter how hard you try. No matter if you say whether or not you know you've been chosen and you came to us this way, of course, I, I could definitely see that. Look, every adoption story is going to come out of some sort of pain, but um, what I've seen um, working with adopt together, <laughs> like the pain that it has come out of comes back a thousand times more in the love that's been given yeah. because it, you uh, these children realize what what a big leap that you're taking as a parent to, to do this you know most people they they have children and it's you know what's biological and what's expected and what comes out of love and romance and like it's the story it takes a really special person to say I'm going to try it this way there's 18 million orphan children in the world and countless people that I know personally just that want children and can't have them yeah and I don't understand why these connections aren't being made they 100% should be it's challenging you're going to have challenges you know it's going to be a different set of circumstances for you and that family as a child and as a parent but um the outcome is so much better than than what could have happened had they never been connected you know yeah um do, is it a business do you feel like is is adoption a business is that why it's so expensive probably you know I think there's a bunch of different really complicated um aspects to the adoption story um it's not perfect for sure but I think that if you um if you're a couple or if you're a single woman or man that just really wants to be a parent and it's not a business to you I think those ways to find your child are absolutely out there you know I think it no it what happens. I mean and I mean in terms of the system if the system is oh a yes business. yeah no 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 I, I don't mean in terms of people what? no 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 but no, getting no, no um I mean because I know so many people exactly what you're saying who want to adopt and they get daunted by the whole thing it's years it's expensive it's many trips to other countries mm-hmm. and maybe they can't afford that it's heartbreaking too because sometimes you get to the end and then something happens and you know, the birth mother wants them back or, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, it's a real. Well, I think it's how it's, it's grounded in something good, right? They want to be able to vet everything. They want to be able to make mm-hmm. sure that they're placing kids in homes that are going to be nurturing and stable and long-term and all like all for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a business component as well, which is, you know, not the best, but mm-hmm. it might be there. But when you think about the, when you think about the, like just hearing you describe what the foster system can create and what a feeling of total displacement can create or not ever having find not ever finding a permanent home always sort of being bounced around can create in terms of feeling of total displacement feeling of lack of connection lack of love mm-hmm. lack of anyone wanting you um and how that creates pe- members of society that don't really want to contribute that have no idea how to contribute you know like i wonder i mean and, and this just shows how ignorant i am on this issue which is a shame mm-hmm. because i think that um, yeah, I think that all parents should that should feel compelled to talk about this because children are our future and we mm-hmm. who better than us to know what children need in terms of how to take care of them and nurture them in a great way to help co- this co- drive this conversation forward so that all children ch- are able to have some kind of access to um, to some to, to a- adults who support them and who are mm-hmm. uh, thoughtful of them. Um, but like I don't even hear about like, uh, you know, orphanages anymore in this country. Anyway, I know they exist, obviously, but like, are there, is there a real organized system of them? Are they happy places? Who supports them? Like, mm. you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, cause that's There's, our back, that's our backup system. If we're not going to let adoptions happen easily, you mm-hmm. know, what's our, what's our fallback? I think, um, what ends up happening? I mean, there's a lot of women or, you know, fam- couples who get pregnant and, and know that they can't support you know so a lot of these people that are waiting for their adoptions it comes from that situation you know it's 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 an, a, the baby goes straight into your arms kind of situation mm-hmm. um but there's a lot of a lot of children in that foster care system who 
um, whose parents just realize that they can't do it, you know, yeah. and those are the children that I personally like really feel for. I know with my mom, she was chosen, she was chosen at 13, you know, you've been through what, a lot by yeah. 13. what you've been through and what, what's happened to you by then is like, it's, it's, it's heavy. So, um, Orphanages, yeah, they're not. It doesn't, it doesn't exist, but the foster care system and like moving around from house to house, that kind of thing does. And then obviously in other countries, it's just it's a whole other thing. I know for Korea, Korea for instance, we went back. Um, my mom and I, I took her back to Korea for the first time since she left. So she did. Was she want to go back? She had a really hard time with it because she left, kind of feeling like her country sort of failed her so to speak. Um, also not knowing if she had real family there and like bringing up all those memories. But we went to, we visited a couple of orphanages and a lot of those kids were there because the parents had, you know, alcoholism issues or the, the, the women were divorced and couldn't have their kids anymore. And the country wouldn't want to really adopt the children out because then it would be admitting failure. Like they couldn't yeah. take mm-hmm. care of their own, um, their own kids. So it's a really thick and complicated, you know, thing. It is, it is um, complicated. But it's it's all I know is when I boil it down and simplify it, the ripple effect that comes with one person, my grandfather and my grandmother, stepping outside of their comfort zone and saying, "I feel like my life is going to, you know, be worthy by give, extending myself for someone who has never been extended anything." And then my brother and I were born and then I met Curtis and then my kids came along and, you know, who knows what they're going to do. And none of that would have ever existed had someone not, you know, had a spark. And that's the part that I just keep holding on to, you know. Yeah. So. How did, yeah. uh, how did your grandmother meet your grandfather? Mm, I think they met. Or oh, her sorry, mother, sorry, her I'm mother. sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, my generation, mom and dad. Yeah. Generation. Okay, <laughs> mom and dad. I'm sorry. Okay, this is the part that gets a little bit crazy and a little bit, you know, it's fun. It's. I grew up feeling like I was a part of this ex- extremely epically romantic story. When I got a little bit older, um, I realized that it could be, it could seem sort of strange. So I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> when my mother was adopted, like I said, she was 13. They rushed her adoption. She was actually the first, I think, or one of the first that was adopted out of Korea at that time, 1963 or four. Um, she came, she went straight into a sanitarium. She had tuberculosis. And that was kind of why they were like, let's go, let's get her there. Um, my grandfather and grandmother had a biological son who was six years older. And he was um, in the Navy, I think at the time, 13. Yeah, in the Navy. He came out, she came out of the hospital, she's 16, he's looking at her and he's like, oh my gosh, this is my sister, she's really beautiful, and didn't really, like they had, he didn't think, oh, we're going to be in love, he just would take her to Disneyland, and by the time she was 17 or 18, they were totally in love. That's so crazy. Oh Head over, they're still married and still totally in love. Oh. I just had them in New York uh, this week, and they're like ha- holding hands. So you only have one Central set of Park. grandparents. One set, That's no in-laws. Amazing. That's crazy. And of course, my grandparents, especially at that time, because interracial relationships were not not There's happening. So much about that. that so was, like, much. Very Wait, taboo. Your, your your grandparents are not Korean. No, my um my grandparents, my dad's parents are you know German Irish, like California white people, <laughs> um, <laughs> but German Irish lineage, you know, and um, they said absolutely not. You cannot get married. You're confusing how you feel. You right. know, like you're having confusing feelings, but it's not. It's not happening, basically. So they made them date other people for two years, and they did. But then at the end of it, they were like, we're we're in love. You know, I don't know how seriously they dated other people because it was always just, you know, it was the two of them. And then my my grandparents were like, okay, cool. You can get married. My grandparents, my grandfather married them. Oh, my Um, goodness. And the rest is sort of history, yeah. <laughs> so you know what? It's equal parts like amazingly romantic and really weird. <laughs> it I is, love, you know, like it's. I, I know it. them, so I'm like extremely. It's a hundred percent the way the kismet, like the way they were supposed to meet. That's mm-hmm. why it was supposed to happen. But I would, I would tell the story, um, like you know, people would say, "How'd your parents meet?" and the whole thing. And Curtis, actually, my husband was the first person to be like, "Maybe you shouldn't." tell everybody that story you know like and as I've been working with adopt together as well I think there are really complicated awful things that happen where girls come over and like you know like there's but this is not that story no but and it's almost like if you believe in like fate and like star-crossed lovers it's like your grandfather got like went and got her and then that's like and it was all meant to be and here we are 
And here we are. He's waving at us. Um, Okay. What is, uh, thank you so much. Wait, so how can we get involved with Adopt Together? So adopttogether.org, you can check it out. Um, And also we have a huge um, fundraiser. It's a brand new organization, but we have a fundraiser, a fun like party. It's called Baby Ball and it's the weekend of October 11th um, this year. So you can get on and sponsor a family or you can come to the party and see what it's all about. That's it. Yeah. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you.